How's it going, guys? If you've been with me for the few years that I've been on this, um, website, then you have know that I've changed my name and format of my YouTube channel quite a few times. Uh, with my newest format, it is going to be more of a horror-based channel, uh, where I read stories from Reddit and other dark sides of the internet. Yes, I will still game in the occasional review, but my channel will be more based on horror. If you could leave a like, comment, subscribe, it really would help, and share with your friends. It uh, makes me want to put out more content. Uh, hopefully I will grow big one day, but uh, for now I guess it's okay. But yeah, guys, uh, hope makes you dumb. It makes you forgetful and blind and overly eager. Especially when you're a teen girl on the outs with your best and pretty much only friend. It was a tale as old as time. Two childhood besties who pinky swore to never ever stop being friends and grew up and grew apart. At least Claire realized this was happening. I was blissfully and a bit willfully ignorant, still believing in those promises made by flashlight during long ago sleepovers. Sure, I noticed that she'd been talking to other older girls more during classes, calling me less and making excuses not to hang out as much, but we'd gone through lulls before. I didn't expect this to be any different, not until I started receiving the notes. Written in brightly colored jail pens and folded into overly complex shapes, they began appearing on my desk when I arrived at homeroom. Then in my textbooks, carefully nestled between pages, and then jammed in the slits of my locker. I read them all, but the messages in each was pretty much the same. You're ugly. You're a loser. Nobody likes you. I didn't want to admit that I recognized the handwriting in some of them. How could I not? I'd received hundreds of much kinder notes before then. The same large looping letters, she even wrote them using her favorite aqua pen. The one I'd given her for her 14th birthday. I showed her every single one, and every time without so much of batting an eye, she'd give me a hug and tell me people are assholes and I shouldn't listen. I cried into her shoulder and told her honestly how hard it was not to believe everything the notes said, and how I was starting to hate myself more and more, and she would just nod sympathetically along. Maybe she was waiting for me to point out the obvious ask her why, to yell at her and end our friendship, but I never did. We were both cowards in our own ways. I can't say what Claire was holding on to. Maybe I'd become a source of an entertainment for her and her new group of friends. Or maybe she genuinely enjoyed tormenting me. For me, though, it was hope. Hope that it was a phase and that if it was, and that if I was patient and quiet and went along with it, She'd revert back to being the same girl I'd always been close to. Claire continued to feed into it, just enough to keep me stringing along, and I let her. Didn't I say hope makes you dumb? When she come up to me after trig class one day, I dared to let myself believe that I'd been right all along and I couldn't stop the wade, the wide, desperate smile from crossing my face at the sound of her saying my name. Hey, Sally, she said. She started to dress differently, more like those girls she'd been spending time with, and were blonde streaks in her hair that hadn't been there before. But the cheerful greetings sounded just like it always had. Are you busy Friday? Immediately I shook my head no. Do you want to come over? We would rent a vi- Claire cut me off with a little giggle. I already had something in mind. Yeah? It's hard not to sound excited when this was the first time she invited me to do anything in almost a month. You know Patsy and Angela, right? I nodded my enthusiasm, dwindling just a bit at the mention of those two junior girls that Claire had started to replace me with. There's a party in the Crone's Woods Friday night, and I want you to come. We haven't really spent much time together. I miss you. If she hadn't tackled on those three magic words at the end, I might have turned her down. As much as I wanted our friendship to be back to normal, a party with kids at the least two years older than us was not how I pictured it happening, especially when that party was supposed to be taking place in the Crone's Woods. Local legend held that it was haunted by the spirit of Armalee Jones, a spinster who had lived alone and been murdered deep in the woods sometime in the early 1900s. All that remained now was the crumbling remnants of a small stone house that was supposed to have belonged to Armaline and supposedly her restless spirit. I hated scary things, and had always made a point to avoid the Crone's Woods before, but now Claire had said she'd missed me, and that all was needed to hear. We put a plan in place, and told our parents we'd be spending the night at each other's house, and I anxiously awaited Friday's arrival. It was a cold, gray afternoon, and I was getting more unsure of my decision. With 
each passing hour, lying to my parents, something I'd never really done before, had been hard enough, but the idea of being in the Crone's woods after dark was really starting to get to me. It was like I really believed the stories about the place, but it still gave me the creeps. The only thing that kept me from wavering was the thought of Claire and I becoming friends again. After the last bell rang, I shoved all my books in my backpack and hurried out to the quad, where I was supposed to meet the others. Claire was waiting for me, right where she said she would be, and when she saw me, she grinned and hooked her arm through mine. Excited, she asked. Yeah, I said, unconvincing. It's going to be tons of fun. Don't be so nervous, okay? She gave me an arm squeeze and practically dragged me to the parking lot where Pat St. Angela were waiting. We had a few hours to kill before the party really got started, so we drove around town for a while and went to the mall to wander and eat at the food court and stopped by Angela's house to change into more appropriate clothes. They let me borrow an outfit and even helped me put on makeup and do my hair. I was surprised by how much fun I was having and how easily things were falling into place. I talked about boys and school and told jokes and laughed all the way to Crone's Woods. It was just about seven when we started to creep onto the dirt road and that wound the trees through night and fallen thickly and cold and black. I hugged Angela's borrowed denim jacket tightly around myself. I peered out the car window trying to catch any sign of other partygoers driving up the hill, but all I saw was darkness. The road ended in a small clearing and Patsy parked the car. Where's everyone else? I asked, looking over at Claire beside me. A lot of people probably walked up. It's not that far, she said reasonably. The party's at the Crone's house, just up away a bit. Um, okay. Not nervous, are you? Angela snickered from the front. A little, I admitted. Why? Because of the crime? Claire asked. If I half shrugged. Come on, it's fine, Patsy said. Once we get up there, you'll feel better. Besides, it's a stupid urgent le- urban, urban legend. Nothing to be scared of. Despite my rattled nerves, I climbed out the car with the others and followed them towards the footpath that would take us up to the ruined stone structure that had once belonged to Ermeline. We chatted sporadically while we walked a bit, but the ground was uneven and a bit challenging in the dark, so I focused more on staying upright than keeping up with the conversation. I thought they were having the same trouble because after a few minutes, they went quiet too. It wasn't until we'd gone a good way up, and then I started to think that there should have been music, voices, the sound of high schoolers letting loose away from the watchful eyes of their parents. Instead, all I heard was my own footsteps. By the time I realized how wrong that was, the other three had already fallen quietly back. Guys, I paused and glanced over my shoulder. Further down the hill, I heard an uproarious laughter and a car engine rumbled to life. Guys, I shrieked that time. I knew with an icy certainty that it didn't matter. They had left me. All at once, I felt angry, afraid, lost. But most of all, I felt a deep, cutting sorrow, and that thin thread of hope that had left, led me out here in the first place, was finally severed. Tears prickled like needles at my eyes. My pity party was quickly interrupted by the low moan of wind moaning through the threes. A stark reminder of where I was shriveled around the deepening chill and looked around trying to figure out the best way to get back down the hill. It was almost impossible to see more than a foot or two in the front of me. And I took a ginger step back in the direction I'd come from. A twig snapped loudly under my feet. Out of the corner of my eye, a faint light flickered into life far out to my right. Girl, a voice whispery and strangled came to my life. The light bobbled once, twice, and then started to drift towards me. I slapped a hand over my mouth to keep from screaming and started to run as quickly as I dared down the path. I didn't get far before I caught my foot into a dip of the ground and sparled face first into the underbrush. I pushed myself up and looked over my shoulder, only to see the light had faded into total darkness again. I scrambled to my feet and limped a few more steps. Another light, this one off to my left, started to weave slowly between the trees. From my right, the voice raspier and rougher, angrier, repeated the same word as before, girl. This time I couldn't stop myself from screaming. With no sense of direction and no real visibility, I drove, I dove forward again. I pushed myself onward as fast as I could go. Despite my ankles throbbing in protest, I didn't know if I was still on the path heading down to the clearing or if I'd veered off further into the woods, but I couldn't stop to try to figure it out. I stumbled along clumsily, driven by the sound of steady stomping footsteps that seemed to come from every direction. The cry of girl echoed from both sides, sometimes a harsh whisper, sometimes a near shriek. 
Each raged call was a reminder that was said Ammerline Jones had had her throat cut before being strangled. I tripped again and roughly, rolled roughly a few times until I was able to get up to my knees and stop myself. Lights flashed a few times further up the hill and then it was all dark and quiet except for my own whimpers. I pulled myself over a nearby tree and hurled it against its trunk. Girl, the, vo the voice hissed from somewhere off to my right. Girl, it repeated from my left. It sounded like she was all around me, closing in with her malicious fury. Ermeline had been a loner in life, and now in death she was vengeful, leaves rustled, and, leaves rustled and crunched with every slow step that took towards me. The light flashed again, from one side and then the other. Girl, she howled in that awful dual voice that surrounded me from just beyond the tree. I pressed both hands over my mouth to try and quit the terrified sobs that were burning in my chest. She was so close I could hear her breathing hard and heavy. To my left, just next to me, a light appeared. I couldn't stop myself. Terror drove me, launching to my feet, and I borrowed unthinkingly away from it to the opposite direction. Almost immediately, another light flickered. I'm just in the front of me, and I collided with someone, something, and shoved it violently away as I felt it to my backside. There was a short yelp, and the light fell away, followed by the sound of fast tumbling down the hill and a thick, heavy thud. The silence that came away was broken by a voice calling out nervously from behind me. Claire? By the time Patsy and Angela were able to rush into the town and get, back, get help back up the hill, Claire was dead. It was just supposed to be a joke, they said in the investigation that followed on, that had all been Claire's idea. She had known I was scared of the legend of the Crones Wood and wanted to play a prank on me because I had been annoying her and how clingy I was. Once they'd walked into the details, that lured me into the woods and then quietly split up behind my back when we were far enough and Patsy returned to the car and made it sound as if they left while Claire and Angela spread out on either side. The voices I'd heard had been there. So the floating lights were just their flashlights as they turned them off and on and pursued me. And the flashes I'd seen had been from the disposable cameras they'd brought to document my fear. They'd never meant for anyone to get hurt, especially not clear. She'd been standing, standing just off to my side, opposite Angela, waiting to turn on her flashlight to reveal herself and laugh at me when I suddenly bolted right into her and unintentionally pushed her down the hill. A thud we'd heard had been the sound of her head colliding with a tree. She was buried. A week and a half later, after it was concluded that it was really just an unfortunate accident, I couldn't bring myself to go to her funeral. Her parents didn't want me there anyway. They blamed me for her death. That was okay because I did too. My family moved away a few months later. I wasn't coping well and my parents thought it was the best if we had a change of scenery. They believed that it would help me, that I would forget to move on and maybe even forget, but I knew it would never be the same. I knew I would never forget the sound of Claire hitting the tree and Angela's frantic run back through the woods to get to the car. I knew I would never forget kneeling beside Claire when she gasped and gasped and stared at me with those wide, panicked eyes, illuminated by the flashlight that had fallen beside her. I would never forget pinching her nose and closed and covering her mouth with my hand. She didn't struggle much. She couldn't. It didn't take long. I had hoped that Claire and I couldn't, could have been friends again. It was all I wanted, but I realized then, after seeing what lengths she was willing to go to hurt me, that was impossible. She hadn't changed too much. I had changed too much. Hope makes you dumb. And I was just tired of playing the fool. Alright guys. Alright guys. If you did watch the video, I hope you enjoyed. I really did enjoy reading this story. And I hope to hear more from the writer. I will leave her name in the story of the name. In the link to the story on Reddit. In the description. But anyways guys, if you could leave a like, comment, subscribe. And as always, I'll see you in the next video. Bye bye guys.